Welcome to the 45th episode of the ClassCast podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Tibbins. Today, I'm going to record a short episode, talk with you a little bit about the options for returning to school for people who have been experiencing distance learning and online school for the first marking period or for the first maybe semester of the 2020-2021 school year. Now, we've heard a lot of concerns and a lot of complaints from a lot of different people, uh, parents, students, teachers, administrators, superintendents, uh, everyone involved has concerns and rightfully so. I think what we're dealing with right now is a situation in which essentially none of our options are ideal. Okay, what what we're left with is making the best decision from a bunch of less than ideal options. Now, I think that many people want to get, quote unquote, back to normal as quickly as possible. And I've already recorded some podcasts about this uh, last spring and through the first part of the summer, how the desire to get back to normal makes a lot of sense, but probably isn't very forward thinking. We've been presented with this opportunity to make drastic changes to public schooling and to the school system, to our instructional models, to a, a lot of things, really. There's a lot of things we could do better than we did before in the quote unquote normal school scenario. However, the longer we remain out of school, the longer things stay online, the more we're hearing the public push for a return to normal. I think at this point, many of those opportunities may have already been squandered, but I I still hold out hope for some. Now, as we're looking at transitioning from distance learning back to some form of hybrid schooling, you know, where some students will be online, some students will be in school, etc., most school systems, mine included, have presented sort of three sort of basic options, right? There, Well, maybe four. There's the return to school with just everyone 100% back to school, which at this point looks very unlikely for, for most places, unless you're in a very small school, rural school, private school. Most places, you're not really going to be able to see 100% of the students back in the building full time, five days a week, just because you're not going to be able to adhere to any of the um, social distancing guidelines and some of the, the health recommendations from the CDC, the WHO, etc. And that leaves us with the hybrid model, which is some variety and, and Different, different school divisions will do this differently, but essentially where students are in school two days per week and then working online at home three days per week. Now, that's what is most likely to occur in, in most of the places in sort of the mid-Atlantic region around where I work. Um, I have family and friends who teach in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Georgia, and a few other places that are all seeing some variety of this hybrid instruction. What is going to be really interesting is to see how people uh, choose this and sort of what their expectations are. What I'm doing here in this episode is I want to talk through some of the maybe unseen or, or, you know, the less desirable outcomes or realities that maybe some people aren't thinking about. Okay, so right now, let's let's start with distance learning. That's what I'm doing right now. 100% of my students are online. I'm working from my basement every day, right? The limitations are obviously that it puts a lot more pressure on individual students to access materials, to handle their own reading, to reach out for help when they need it. Even the best teachers are struggling a little bit with sort of the the quick check-ins and the formative assessment. It's very difficult, say, as an English teacher, for me to know where a student's having trouble with their writing or if they're having trouble in a timed situation when I can't see them writing in front of me. I can't see it in in live uh, action. So, you know, I depend on them to ask for help or I do quick check-ins, but that that's not ideal okay and and i'm thinking about as as a high school teacher and high school students that is a thousand times harder for elementary school students and elementary school teachers online school has some clear benefits there's a lot of flexibility there's some some cool things we can do in terms of using the technology and i think at least some students like this as much or maybe more than in person school but i don't think that represents the majority okay the the shortcomings really you know it it really can be difficult to manage the workload and the timing and all the rest i think teachers and students alike are struggling with how much extra work this is and maybe how a lot of us didn't fully see that coming the next option is that hybrid option, okay? But there's two varieties of hybrid learning. Uh, some some school divisions, and, and my school division at one point was floating this idea, they now keep it on the table, though they say it is not recommended, is essentially the idea that some students and teachers will stay online 100%, and then some students will switch to the hybrid model, where they're in school two days a week, say A day, B day, and then they're home working perhaps asynchronously, uh, you know, on their own independent work, uh, three days a week. Now, that that's what most places had talked about, and I think in, in, a, in a way seems ideal. The difficulty is if you're going to switch to that model in the middle of a school year, that means that, say for me, I teach uh, advanced placement English language and composition, and there are two teachers in my school who teach that, that particular class. 
if you know if they choose to do the half students go hybrid and half stay online then essentially one of the teachers is going to have to be the online teacher and one is going to have to be the hybrid teacher well that means that the teachers have to sort it out and the administration has to figure it out but that also means that whenever we do this switch i assume at the end of a semester but it, it could happen really at any point students who say choose to be in school for the hybrid model but are currently scheduled with the distance learning teacher they would have to switch that means partway through the school year you get a new teacher with a new set of expectations um, possibly new assignments maybe some things weren't covered in the same way or at the same pace so it's it's going to be really messy and for a while that sounded like that was going to be the recommended model but more recently we're hearing that in my division and in many others that is not going to be the recommended path forward because people are recognizing school administrators in particular are recognizing the difficulty and complexity of changing those schedules of adjusting the course loads it also means that some classes like i also teach public speaking i'm the only teacher in my school that teaches public speaking that means you know if, if students choose to go hybrid and i were to stay online or vice versa some of those students would essentially be left out of the class and so next semester as we start into a new a new class you know a, a new grouping then some of those students would be forced to drop the class you know and that that does not seem good that that's not ideal for most people we want all the students to have access to the courses that they want to take the other option is the concurrent hybrid learning which is now uh being presented as the recommended model from my school administration or my division administration. And I'm hearing that this is going to be recommended by many of the surrounding jurisdictions, as well as some places that I'm hearing about in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, et cetera. Um, I also, I think this is already going on in many parts of the country. Essentially the concurrent hybrid learning model means that everybody stays in their classes. It means the teachers would report to school and it means that you would have a mix of in-person and then online students. So for example, let's say we're talking about my fourth block AP language class. Okay. And so that, that would be at the end of the day on the A day. When I teach that class, all students would have asynchronous learning on Mondays to allow teachers time to prep, hold meetings, etc. On Tuesday, we would have the A day. So I would have half of the hybrid students enter my classroom. So if there's 26 kids in the class, and let's say for the sake of ease, half of them choose to stay online and half choose to, to go to the hybrid model and go to school for a couple days a week. On that day, that means that I would have out of the 13 hybrid students, I would have about half of them. So I would have six or seven students in the room with me, all socially distanced, spread out, not sharing materials, not really able to collaborate in the ways we normally expect in school. The other hybrid students would be online that day watching from home on a live stream. And then the distance learning students, the other 13 students who would have decided to stay online altogether, they would be watching all the time. Okay. So then we would have, uh, say the next day, the Wednesday would be a B day. Well, now those students all go to their other classes, et cetera, et cetera. When we get back to Thursday, the next A day, I would have the other half of the hybrid students, six or seven students in the room, while all the other kids approximately 20 kids would be watching a live stream of the class online. Think about what this means for actual instruction. As a teacher, you are always functioning with some utilitarian thinking. Okay, we, we try to avoid this, we say we don't do this, but if we're being honest, public school is a utilitarian institution. We try to create the greatest good for the greatest number of people. That's why programs like ELL classes, special education, uh, gifted ed, other programs are so important because generally speaking, school is set up in a way where it works pretty well for most people, but it doesn't necessarily work ideally for everyone, which is why we have to make special programs and exceptions. Well, that also means that when faced with a difficult situation in the classroom where many students are working one way and a few are working a different way, the teacher is one, of course, going to try to differentiate and address the needs of all the students. But it also means that when forced to choose. Almost all teachers are going to make the decision to do what benefits most of the students in the room and then figure out something later to catch up with those other kids and, and to bring them back up to speed. So if you say as a parent, if you want your child back in school, you want that face-to-face -face contact with the teacher, I want you to remember that you're going to be in, that child's going to be in school for seven plus hours throughout the day, wearing a mask 100% of the time, except while eating lunch. They're going to be seated at least six feet away from the other students in the room and they're not going to be able to swap materials. The teacher is not only going to be trying to address and talk with those students, but they're also then going to be worried about the 20 other students watching the class live online, just like they were when everyone was in 100% distance learning. Now, as a teacher, what does that mean for me? It means that I'm still running my distance learning class. 
I'm teaching this basically the same way I was before, except now there are six or seven kids in front of me in the room. If one of them has a question, they can raise their hand. And that's great. It's probably going to be a lot easier to get kids to raise their hands and get involved in that way when they're live in person. However, those students are all still going to need to have their their Google Meet or their Zoom or Microsoft Teams, whatever software you use. They're all still going to need to have that uh, live because if their classmates who are working from home have a question and they put it in the chat, all the students need to know what the question is. If someone else is raising their hand online, you know, they hit the button and the little hand icon pops up, the students in the room still need to know that those other students are raising their hand and that multiple people are trying to get involved. So what does this mean? It means that the actual instructional model is unlikely to change in any significant way. It also means that when we build in pieces for collaboration, where students are going to work together in pairs or in small groups, those students are still going to be working in their small groups through that online software. We will not be allowed to put students in a group in the hallway or, or circle up your desks and get together. That's not going to fit into the, the social distancing guidelines that we presented with. So what does it mean, again, focusing on a high school class, what does it mean when we say students will be in school to return to quote unquote normal instruction? Well, one, it's not normal instruction. Anyone who says that is probably, you know, either talking too fast or, or misleading you. It means that the student will physically be in the building. We're already hearing guidelines about the number of students who can go to the bathroom, uh, about when they can go. They won't be able to go between classes because you can't have too many kids in the room at the same time. We're hearing different guidelines on lunch. Will students be eating lunch in a classroom versus the cafeteria? Um, they're not going to be able to group up in the halls and hang out and talk to their friends. We're essentially going to be sending kids into the school building to sit in the classroom and conduct their distance learning classes that they were before. Now, the, and again, the reason for that is that as a teacher, it is my job to address the needs of all the students in front of me. No student is more or less important than any other student. And if I have 20 students live streaming the class online and six or seven in front of me, as much as the natural inclination, the instinct is to talk to the people in front of you. The reality is I have to be mindful that everything we're doing has to work for all the kids in the room. And that means that almost all of my planning, that almost all of my time is going to be put into the same distance learning model that we've been doing all along. All we're going to change is the physical location. Now, for elementary school students, I think that this might yield a little bit more of a benefit than it will for the average high school student, just because for elementary school students, uh, one, we have childcare concerns, and two, the opportunity to get out of the house, to actually see the other people sort of talking, raising their hands. You know, you're going to build a little more, uh, let's call it social fluency, social skills, and, and that's an important thing. It's also very important for uh, many high school students, especially in, in special education and, and English language learner populations. But I do think a lot of people have some misguided ideas about what a return to school and hybrid learning is going to be. Now, if we were to do hybrid learning without the live streaming, right, if you just do distance learning for some kids and then the other kids go in and do, do their hybrid stuff, that would work better instructionally, in my opinion, because the teacher will have the ability to focus on the students in the room or they will have the ability to focus on the students online. However, if we go with concurrent hybrid learning, where you're going to have a certain number of students who stay distance all the time, and then the other students are going to split, they'll be in the room one day and they'll be watching from home the other, then nothing about the actual instructional model is going to change. It also doesn't change anything in terms of the pacing or the workload, because the class planning remains the same. The teacher cannot drastically change the plans for the students who are going to be in person, because half of the class, give or take, is going to stay online all the time, and because some of those other face-to-face -face students won't be there on that day, right? Now, if I see half that half of half of the half, right, if I see a quarter of my class Tuesday and a quarter of my class on Thursday, you'd say, well, you could have them do an activity where they can work together in the room. Well, we can't share materials. We can't sit too close together. But you also have to remember that if we're live streaming, the students who are 100% distance learning are watching both of the lessons. So the Tuesday and Thursday lessons can't be the same thing. They can't have the same activity because now I'm wasting the time of 50% of the kids enrolled in the class. We don't have many good options here, but what we can do is make the best of some bad options or some less than desirable choices. I don't think that 100% distance learning is the correct answer for all students or for all teachers. It's certainly not working for all families.
I also don't know that, you know, going into the hybrid model is, is going to be significantly better or significantly worse for everyone involved. But given that we cannot at, the, at this time, we cannot put all the students back in the room in a more quote unquote normal situation, then I think we need to be very, very cautious about the idea of live streaming and, and having students working concurrently online and in the classroom. Now, I'm not saying I, I can't do it. I'm not saying that I won't do it. I'm just pointing out that right now we have a lot of parents, particularly who are very frustrated. We have some students who are also feeling very frustrated. And I think that for a lot of those people, they think that a return to school, even two days a week is going to serve as some sort of, some, some sort of cure. We're going to have this panacea where the stress and the workload and all these things will just even out and go away. And, and I'm recording this podcast to, to, send up a send up a warning flare and essentially say that I don't think it's actually going to present that much of a difference. What you are going to have is that everybody has to, you know, everyone who's going has to get dressed <laughs> appropriately. And, you know, you're not gonna be doing class in your slippers and pajamas anymore. Um, but th there really won't be much else. Okay, the teacher is not going to be able to walk over and handle the materials on a student's desk to point out mistakes. Students are still going to be submitting their work online electronically. Everything's still going to be going through whatever your learning management system is, Canvas, Schoology, Blackboard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that we need to think be very cautious about what our expectations are for a return to school this year, uh, or at least until there's a vaccine available or until um, the situation changes where we can have more students in the room and the social distancing guidelines reduce. I feel very strongly that I should be doing whatever I can to help my students and whatever educational model I think is best is the one I'll advocate for. That being said, I'm not the guy that gets to make that decision. So if the school board and superintendent decide that we're going back in and we're doing the concurrent hybrid learning and streaming and all the rest, that I'm going to do it. And, and I know that, you know, pretty much all teachers are going to do it and do it as well as they can. What I want parents, what I want students, what I want the general community to recognize is that if we do the concurrent streaming, okay, where the class is being broadcast to the other students at home, then the actual content of the class and the format of the instruction is not going to change in any real meaningful way. It may actually create some additional problems. For example, if I put students into random groups to discuss something that we've read for class, now that means that the students in the room may be working in a group with the students who are working from home. So they'll need to talk into the microphone, you know, talk into their, their laptop or Chromebook as they have been doing all along. However, now we have six or seven students in the same classroom who are all having that same conversation. Imagine the additional background noise and interference. Okay, when we say, all right, let's swap up materials, students' natural instinct may be to hand a paper to someone else, but that's not going to be allowed. Everything is still going to be done digitally and shared that way. I think that there are plenty of other reasons that we want students in the building, but a big part of it is the social piece. It's getting out of your house. It's having that human contact. It's the support from teachers and the people around you. And, and I don't think that we can overvalue those pieces. I mean, that, that is a, a very important part of what schools do for young people. However, I think for people whose concerns are with the instructional model or with the workload and the timing, I think we need to be honest and point out that a switch to a concurrent hybrid learning model with live streaming is not going to result in any significant change in any of that. And as a result, maybe doesn't do anything to reduce stress, maybe will actually increase it or maintain it because the student now has the pressures of getting ready and showing up to school in person and then continuing to participate in a class that for all intents and purposes is really just the same distance learning class as before. I'm sure I've missed some pieces here. I'm sure I've, I've misidentified a couple of the details. And if so, I, I would appreciate if anybody would reach out and let me know what I'm misunderstanding or missing. However, as I read more and more uh, in online forums from frustrated parents and students or from teachers, etc., I think it's worth just putting it out there that the live streaming option may sound good, but in the end is essentially just a change in where the student sits. It is not going to result in the change in the class. If we can't do 100% separated, you know, hybrid and distance learning, then I'm not sure that the hybrid model is really going to make a significant difference, at least not for most of the students I teach at the high school level. I would love to hear your thoughts on the options between 100% distance learning, the split hybrid, or the concurrent hybrid learning. And please let me know if there's anything that you think I have oversimplified or left out that belongs in this conversation. Most school divisions around me in Northern Virginia will be making their decision in the next week or two, and we'll start to see these shifts coming in the, in the following weeks and over the next two months. I just hope that we all make good decisions and that we understand what we're in for so that we can prepare ourselves and our students appropriately.
Thank you very much for listening to episode 45 of the ClassCast podcast. You can find us at www.classcastpodcast.com, on Facebook and Instagram at ClassCast Podcast, and on Twitter at ClassCast Pod. Thank you very much. Have a good day.